celebrating the body of Messiah, the ecclesia. Ecclesia is translated in the Testament as church. But to be quite frank, I don't use that phrase or that term as much as I used to because we think of all the wrong things when we think of that term. The ecclesia of the church is simply the gathering of the Jesus people. It's not the building. It's not the organizational structure. It is the coming together of those who are in Christ, in Jesus. The Ephesians had a letter that Paul wrote to them. And this letter that Paul writes is a treatise. It's, it's, a, it's a letter of, of information that celebrates basically the gathering of the Jesus people. Um, not just locally, like here at Parkview, but universally, the gathering of the Jesus people wherever it happens in the world. And I'll explain more about that in a few moments. This letter is a summary of Paul's theology in its most practical applications as we go through this letter. And we will take most of this year doing that. So I was in a pastor's meeting here about two weeks ago, a uh, week and a half ago, and um, they were saying, what can we pray about for you? I said, well, pray for our congregation. I'm beginning a series. I'm going to spend the whole year in Ephesians. And the past, one of the past young pastors next to me said, the whole year? And I said, well, yeah. And he said, I spent 10 weeks. Well, there are churches you could probably go through Ephesians in 10 weeks. I'm going to take the whole year. So strap it on. Here we go. And today I'm going to basically just give you a lot of information of understanding what on earth was the world like in Ephesus 2,000 years ago. He's dealing with in this letter the body of the Lord Jesus, not just at a local setting, but an inner congregational setting. When we say universal church, we think of, well, Christians that are everywhere. They have to be somewhere in a localized setting. And I think oftentimes when we think of the universal church, we think of the church that's somewhere else around the world. But as Paul's writing this letter, he's thinking about the churches, plural, in Ephesus, but they didn't meet in buildings like we have. They were most likely house gatherings, maybe 20, 30, 40, 50 people in a gathering, but multiple gatherings, and then in the outlying areas around Ephesus. And so that's what he's trying to, to, to address the issue of the relationship between Christians meeting in all kinds of various locations and places and, and the importance of how it is that they re interact and relate one to another. If I were to summarize this letter, it would be this. In the midst of your various congregations, Christian believers, just get along with each other. That's what Paul's saying to the Ephesians. To all the local churches in Ephesus and in all the outlying areas, where the letter will eventually end up going. Let's begin with the author. It seems rather obvious. Verse 1, Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by God's will. Who wrote the letter? Everybody says, well, Paul did. Well, I can assure you that there are a lot of local congregations where you would go that the pastors would say, well, maybe he wrote it and maybe he didn't. Because about 150, 180 years ago, in what we call higher criticism, there were more liberal theologians who were saying, well, maybe Paul didn't write this letter. In fact, it was a pseudo-Paul. So if you'll allow me for just a moment or two, I got plenty of time, don't worry, I know when it's supposed to close. Why would somebody say that? So I want to share that with you. In the 1800s, there was a case that was being built against the fact that actual apostle Paul wrote this letter. You say, well, what would they base it upon? Well, one of their arguments was this. There are some linguistic features in this letter in the original Koine Greek language that don't appear in all the rest of Paul's letters, and therefore they conclude he probably didn't write it. There was somebody else who maybe, maybe 50, 40, 30, 50, 60 years after Paul, they wrote it in Paul's name. Okay. Well, that's true. There are some terms that Paul that's written in this letter that Paul doesn't use in any of the rest of his letters. Here's the problem with that argument. He did that in every single one of his letters. I could go to every one of the letters he wrote, and there are words that he uses in that letter that he doesn't use in any other letter. That's Paul. So that's not an argument against his authorship. Here's another argument. They would say, well, there's an impersonal tone to this letter. He's writing as if he doesn't know these people. Uh, if you look at chapter 1, verse 15, it says... He says, this is why, since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints. Well, what do you mean you heard about it? See, the apostle Paul spent two and a half to three years in Ephesus building this congregation. So how is it possible 
that he's writing this and he doesn't know who these people are. Because he's writing the letter perhaps up to seven years after he was there ministering. What do you think happened in seven years? The church kept growing. And the majority of the people who made up the church seven years later were not the people that were there when he ministered. It's kind of like Rapid City, South Dakota. Somebody asked me a while back, I've been here since the days of Moses, um, I've been here 23 years. How many people have you ministered to, Dave? And I said, well, I can't give you an exact number, but I'm going to guess, and I'm probably within the ballpark, over 4,000 people in 23 years have come through the doors of this church. Did you know that? That's how transient our culture is in Rapid City. Well, it was no different in the ancient world. So the argument would, we doesn't know anybody. That's okay. The church kept growing. That's a good thing he didn't know everybody. Well, what's another issue going on here? Uh, it had to be somebody not like Paul who, who back in the first century world, it was common that if you had some ideas that you wanted to get out, but you weren't really famous, you would write in the name of somebody far more famous and well-known because of their reputation, you would get a hearing. So you'd fake the letter uh, in that person's name and therefore, oh, they'll listen to what I have to say. So liberal theologians say that must have been what happened. It's Paul, but it really wasn't Paul. Well, what's the problem with that argument? In the Greco-Roman world, while that was a common practice, it was also rejected by the secular society, and it was rejected universally by the Christians that were in the local churches. They knew whether or not Paul was the actual author of something by how he wrote and just by the witnesses to that record. Those are just some of the things that come up. The earliest testimonies that we have beyond the age of the apostles is universal. Paul wrote this book. For example, you're not writing this stuff down, but I think it's just good sometimes to know what's out there. Uh, Clement of Rome, uh, he wrote in the first century, within the first, probably in the 90s AD, he said Paul wrote this letter. Well, that's pretty reliable. That's close to when the letter was written. Ignatius, early in the second century, said that Paul wrote this letter. Polycarp, early in the second century, said Paul wrote this letter. And I could list some others, and I will. Clement of Alexandria, Tertullian of Carthage, the Epistle of Barnabas, Shepherd of Hermas. All of these documents were written within less than 100 years of this being written, and every one of them said Paul wrote the letter. So, we have a defense against liberal theologians who say, well, he probably didn't write the letter, it was in no, Paul wrote the letter. The evidence of history is there. So we can rest assured, yeah, Paul wrote the letter. So some of you, if you go off to college or if you go off to a school and they kind of mock the New Testament and they say, well, you know, the authors didn't really write the book, you know, at least a little bit of a tidbit. No, we have a reliable Bible of the people who wrote the Bible, okay? When did Paul write Ephesians? Well, he wrote it from his first Roman imprisonment. Paul had two Roman imprisonments. His first Roman imprisonment is recorded in Acts chapter 28. He was under house arrest for two years. Okay? He was uh, uh, in his own quarters. Uh, he probably was chained to some Roman soldiers. They would have changed the guard every few hours. By the way, eventually through that endeavor, did you know that there were people who came to faith in Jesus that were in Caesar's household? Isn't that a great strategy for evangelism? Get yourself arrested. Way to reach the Roman emperor, okay. Well, in any case, he's there, probably from the years 59 to about 62 A.D. You might want to note that, write it down. But he also wrote two other New Testament letters at the same time that he wrote Ephesians, and we'll talk about that in just a moment. If you look at Ephesians chapter 6, verse 21, he mentions an interesting guy. I don't know if you, I, I would recommend that you don't name your boy um, maybe bore this name, but Tychicus, that's just hard to say anyway. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother and faithful servant in the Lord, will tell you all the news about me so that you may be informed. Guess who's carrying the letter to the Ephesians? Tychicus, okay? I want you to turn with me to Colossians. Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians. Uh, chapter 4. Look at verse 7. Tychicus, our dearly loved brother and faithful servant and fellow slave in the Lord Jesus. Wouldn't you love to have that written about you? 
will tell you all the news about me. I have sent him to you for this very purpose so that you may know how we are and that he may encourage your hearts. Okay? So you got this guy, Tychicus. But one more little name in the next verse. And he is with Onesimus. Well, who on earth is Onesimus? Would you turn with me to another book called Philemon? Actually, for sake of time, let me just say something about this. Read verses 10 and 11 in Philemon because it mentions Tychicus. The issue is that there was something happening in the last part of Paul's arrest. Uh, he's there for about two years. And what he says is that he thinks that he's going to get released from his Roman imprisonment. I take it that this, these letters were all written about the same time, 62 AD, somewhere within that year. And as a result, he's been away from Ephesus for perhaps six, maybe even seven years. And there's significant growth in that congregation. He doesn't know everybody. So he's about to send out this letter to the Ephesians, but he's sending more than that. Which leads us to the occasion of what's going on. He's under house arrest, but he's anticipating his trial before Caesar. And he's not quaking in his boots, by the way, or his sandals. Uh, in fact, he has a lot of confidence that God is in this. And in fact, in Philemon, he says this, but meanwhile, also to Philemon, uh, a brother in the Lord that's back in the Ephesus area, he says, prepare a guest room for me, for I hope that through your prayers I will restore to you. He's expecting to be released from his Roman imprisonment, and he expects to be able to go back to visit his friend Philemon. But there's something else that's going on in Paul's life as he's under house arrest. In his mind, he's thinking, okay, I'm going to be released. I, I trust the Lord. I think it's going to happen. And Lord, if I get released, what were the ambitions of his apostolic heart? He's wanting not to really go back east uh, to, to Asia Minor, to the area of, of Turkey, which modern-day Turkey. He's really wanting to go, go west. He's wanting to go to Spain. He's wanting to have an outreach to Spain and to the people where the gospel's never gone. That's in his heart. He writes about it. And so he receives, as he's wrapping up, as he thinks he's going to get released, he's got a time that's approaching when he's going to appear before Caesar to defend why he's under arrest, be able to proclaim the gospel. He receives startling news. We don't know exactly how, but that there's a church, a gathering of the Jesus people in another city in Asia Minor called Colossae. And the news that he receives is that there's a spreading heresy of theological belief that's infecting the believers in the gathering of what we call the church at Colossae. And so he's concerned. It raises an alarm in his heart. And he, he realizes, I need, to get, I need to get some information then before I, I don't know for certain I'm going to get released, but i, I got to address that situation. While that's going on, there's, there's another situation that arises. About that time, there's a slave called Onesimus. Don't name your child that either. Onesimus runs away from his slave owner, Philemon. Philemon's a Christian. Could Christians own slaves? Yes, they did. And so Onesimus is running away from his slave owner. We're not sure of the reasons why. And when you run away from Asia Minor, where are you usually heading? To Rome. And he ends up in Rome. And he ends up in Rome. And what happens? We don't know how, but somehow he's crossing paths with a man who's under house arrest, the Apostle Paul. Well, guess what Paul's going to do? That, that's rhetorical. You don't have to answer. But Paul leads him to Jesus. Okay? And in the process of leading Onesimus to Jesus, Onesimus confesses, oh, by the way, you're telling me the same thing that my owner used to tell me, and he's a follower of Jesus, and, and I ran away. Now I ran away. I took some things from him. So now Paul has this situation. That what does Paul do as a problem solver? Onesimus, you need to go back. How's that for being politically correct in our world? You need to go back to your slave owner. But I'm going to write you a letter. And so he writes Philemon. And he says, Philemon, this man is a brother in the Lord. He's my son in the faith. And, and I'm sending him back to you. But this time I want you to receive him back as a brother in Jesus. 
And there's some implications in the way Paul writes, and grant him a measure of freedom. So he's writing a letter to Philemon. He's writing a letter to the Colossians. And he, at the same time, thinks, well, if I'm writing to those two situations, I might as well write a letter to the Ephesians. And he writes all three. In fact, we know that he wrote Colossians first and then Ephesians because he's quoting a lot of proportion of what's in Colossians in Ephesians. And he sends all three letters. And guess who the courier is? Tychicus. So that's how it comes about. And he sends him off. I don't know if that grabs you, but it's kind of interesting to me anyway. Setting. He's addressing these Jesus people in Asia Minor. Asia Minor is modern-day Turkey. Some of you, maybe you've been there. You've been to Ephesus. I know some of you have traveled to Ephesus. Uh, you've seen the ruins, the most, the most fantastic ruins of any city in, in the world, archaeologically, uh, as far as what they've unearthed, is the city of Ephesus. Okay. Paul ministered in Ephesus for two and a half to three years. Uh, it's recorded in the book of Acts, from about 53 to 56 A.D. He spent several days with the Ephesian elders uh, when he went back um, through the region. He did not stop at Ephesus. He was on a huge cargo ship, and the bay at Ephesus was too shallow to have that ship land there, so went a little bit further south to a place called Miletus. And when he's at Miletus, he calls for the Ephesian elders to come down, and he spends a few days with them. And so that would have been in the spring of 57 A.D. That's the last that he would have had any kind of contact with the Ephesians. And so he's writing, as it were, this letter. Uh, he's writing it at 62 A.D. He hasn't been there for at least five years, and perhaps really he met the elders. So since he was actually in Ephesus, we could say almost six or seven years since he's been there. What was Ephesus like? Well, first of all, it was a lot bigger than Rapid City. Ephesus was 250,000 people, okay, 250,000. It was the third largest city of the Roman Empire. There were three main superhighways that went through Ephesus, and Ephesus was connected with the empire all the way to Rome. Um, I thought about that when I went down to Denver a week ago, and we were driving on the interstate, and I thought, well, you know, they maybe not, didn't have interstate, but it was the same kind of feeling when you began to approach a city of 250,000 people. Um, there was a Roman theater there. If you would look up uh, and show that theater, see if I have my pointer with me. I don't have it with me. What you're looking at, I said, do in my pocket. What I, yes, what I do. I want you to know something. Something was going down at the base of that theater, and this theater seats 25,000 people. Okay? You're looking at where the actual biblical event took place. The riot at Ephesus over Paul and his ministry over leading so many Ephesians to Jesus who were Gentiles that it impacted the economy of a city of 250,000 and basically it gathered in opposition to the gospel 25,000 people in that theater who for two hours shouted at the top of their lungs, great is Artemis of the Ephesians. Can you imagine for two hours? Talk about the gospel having an impact. Interesting. This is in Ephesus, and this is the theater. You can keep it up there for a little bit. That theater was used for dramas, just like a theater or an amphitheater would be used today. Musical performances, public events, religious observances. Their, their various religions, they would lead parades through the city that would lead to the theater. Um, there would be extravaganza blood baths of, of gladiators that would fight at the base. And if you can imagine at the base of this, this entire base on one occasion was flooded with water. And miniature ships were put on this to reenact the naval engagement of the Roman legions for entertainment. If you think we're sophisticated, I've not seen that done by anybody else. You say, how did they do it? I don't have a clue. But they did. It also contained a three-story library. The capacity of that library may not seem like a lot to you until you realize that a scroll of one book was about this size. They had 12,000 scrolls in the library. It was one of the largest libraries in the ancient world. It had one of the largest banks in the ancient world. 
It was an economic center for the province of Asia Minor, for the Roman Empire. And it was the capital for the Roman Senate over that region in Asia Minor, we call Turkey. And then it had the Temple of Artemis. It was one of the greatest buildings in the ancient world. It was four times the size of the Parthenon. And some of you maybe have been to Athens and you've seen the Parthenon. The, this particular temple was four times the size. Let me share with you. Uh, if you go from about where I'm at to the back of the wall, maybe take a gander, okay? And if you do that six more times, actually six and a half more times, that's how long the temple was. And if you go from that wall to that wall, okay, and you do that, um, I have to look at my notes here a minute, three and a half times, that's how wide it was. We're not talking about some little tiny building, okay? Um, it had 127 marble columns supporting the massive roof of this temple. Um, they were seven feet in diameter. I can't get my arms wide enough for seven feet. This ceiling is maybe 20 feet about. It was 60 feet in height of the columns. Okay? 36 of those columns were covered in solid gold. That's the temple of Artemis. Okay? Artemis, or Diana, was the goddess, a goddess, in the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods. But um, she was worshipped all over the ancient world. But Artemis of the Ephesians was a little bit different in what she was known for and, and some aspects of how she was worshipped. If you bring up the next picture of Artemis, I'd like to introduce her to you. This is Artemis of the Ephesians, okay? One of these images, I can't remember which, is about six inches tall, and the other is about six feet tall that we've discovered, okay? That's Artemis of the Ephesians. These are various bulbs on the chest of this particular goddess. These are all different little animals that are on her. And, and it's been interesting because if you go to Ephesus today, they'll give you an explanation of what this cult, this religious system was about. And I'd like to tell you today, they're right, wrong. They're 100% wrong because they haven't kept up with archaeology and they haven't kept up with history and research. So let me tell you what they thought it was. If you'll turn with me just a moment to the book of Acts. Chapter 19, verse 23. I love this. We're in Ephesus, as Paul is there ministering over these two to three years. During that time, there was a major disturbance about the way. Christianity was not known as Christianity. The Christian movement was called the way. Okay? And for a person named Demetrius, a silversmith who made silver shrines of Artemis, the shrines were probably not just of her particularly, though we see these images. They included some other things. It provided a great deal of business for the craftsmen. And when he had assembled them, as well as the workers engaged in this type of business, as we continue on, he says, Man, you know that our prosperity is derived from this business. Okay? The uh, gospel was touching people's pocketbooks. You both see and hear that not only in Ephesus, but in almost all of Asia, Turkey, okay, uh, this man, Paul, has persuaded and misled a considerable number of people by saying that the gods made by hands are not gods. If you're in the God-making business, that's a problem, okay? So not only do we run a risk that our business may be discredited, but also that the temple of the great goddess Artemis may be despised and her magnificence come to the verge of ruin and everyone in all of Asia and all the world adore. Now when you talk about her magnificence, when I describe to you the size of that temple, you can understand the magnificence for a person to walk up in the ancient world, see a building that big, that tall, with that much gold, with an idol that big in the center of it. What they were making were little images, not of necessarily of Artemis, but from other documents that we read. They were making little images of the shrine itself. 
And what a worshiper would do would take that shrine, buy it from the silversmiths, take the shrine into the temple, lay the shrine at a place of worship, and then give various offerings, food, but mostly financial offerings, to placate the goddess to gain her favor. Well, if you're not buying the shrine and you're not coming to the temple and you're not you're impacting the entire economy of Ephesus and of the region. And by the way, that would have eventually caught the attention of Rome for taxation purposes. Many scholars have asserted down through history that Artemis of the Ephesians was a fertility goddess. If you go to Ephesus, they'll still give you that explanation. She was a fertility goddess. She was a nurturing mother goddess. All of these bulbs on her chest are uh, referenced as breasts for her sensuality and for her nurturing as a, as a mother goddess. Um, the popular myth, now let me take a few minutes to share with you what the, what the belief system was. Artemis is the virgin daughter of Leto and Zeus. Leto is the woman, Zeus is the, is the god. And she is the older twin to Apollo in this pantheon, in this mythology. And according to mythology, at birth, Artemis was born or came into existence and was quite normal in the process, had full mental capability in coming into existence. But her brother, Apollo, it took nine days for uh, Leto to deliver him and was in quite agony in that process, which Artemis supposedly witnessed. This is just stories, this is mythology, okay? So the outcome is Artemis had no desire to give birth herself. She asked her father Zeus if he would make her immune to Aphrodite's arrows, arrows of love and sensuality, and Zeus granted that wish. So the resulting belief was that Artemis of the Ephesians, and this is where the change comes, they'll explain to you she's a goddess of sexuality. She is not a goddess of sexuality. What, is, what we've discovered in, in, in letters that are written and documents as we research and so forth is that she had special sympathy with women who were in childbirth. And so she became associated with virginity and midwifery. Rather than Artemis having um, many breasts and associated with sex and mothering and nurturing as a mother goddess, she's not covered with sexual objects, as it were. Artemis of the Ephesians was a goddess associated with midwifery, strength, safety, and delivery. She was referred to time and again as Artemis Savior, Artemis our Savior. When you read what Paul writes to the Ephesians and what Paul writes to, first, to Timothy, he writes a little bit earlier than this letter, and Timothy at that time was there pastoring at Ephesus. He constantly refers to God our Savior or Christ or Jesus our Savior. Why? Because what they were used to is Artemis our Savior. Um, life expectancy in the first century. Do you know what it is? Life is 25 years of age. I bet you didn't know that. Um, only four men out of 100 live beyond the age of 50 and less for women. Um, childbirth was the number one killer of women in the first century world and through most of human history. For the population to remain consistent, Every woman had to bear about five children, and if that's the number one killer of women, let me ask you, what is the number one fear of women in the first century world? What are you going to worship? You're going to worship any kind of a deity that promises power and protection over the birth process. Artemis plays a significant role in the culture. And by the way, when you read 1 Timothy, you read this interesting little verse about how Paul writes that the believers in Jesus, women, don't worry, you will be saved through childbirth. Why would he write that? You don't have to go to Artemis. You've got the author of life, Jesus Christ, to gain and watch over you in that process. Those of Asia Minor saw Artemis as a goddess with the ability to deliver a woman through life's most dangerous passage. She was viewed as presiding at births without herself associated with sex or fertility. What are some of the religions? I'm going to move quickly. There's first of all the worship of Artemis. There's the worship of the emperor. It was a significant belief system. 
The imperial cult offered a compelling explanation for the, the reason Rome was basically in power, as it were. It was a great honor to be a temple warden, uh, meaning a city where you were specifically representing the region for the worship of the emperor. And in 25, 26 AD, 11 cities in Asia Minor were considered. Ephesians was one of the cities, even though it was the capital of the province, it wasn't chosen. Why? Because Artemis was so powerful in the worship of that city and region. Two religious festivals for Artemis were held every year, March and April, and in May and June, and the processions went to the amphitheater through the streets. It was also the center for the practice of magic, ancient magic. I'm not talking about illusions. Bruce Metzger, a theologian, says this, by far the most hospital of magicians, sorcerers, and charlatans of all source were welcomed at Ephesus. Ephesus was the center of the study of magic, and when I say dead magic, I mean supernatural power of the demonic realm. It was the center in the ancient world. Artemis was not by nature a goddess of magic. But there was some connection between Artemis and the demonic practices of the magic that were going on within that region. We just don't, at this date, know exactly all of what those connections were. In Acts chapter 19, verses 18, 19, and 20, it tells us that at one point, the conversion rate of believers in Ephesus was so powerful that when they came together, they burned uh, all of this uh, particular uh, scrolls that was valued at 50,000 days wages. So let me translate that for you. What is your daily wage? Not annual, daily. I don't care what it is. Just put your mind there, whatever it is you make. It's 137 years of value that was burned. That's how powerful the worship of Artemis was in that particular realm and of the practice of magic. Its significance, well, as I said, it was the capital. It was governed by Rome. What's the purpose of this particular letter? And for sake of time, I'm going to speed it up a little bit. Judaism was an accepted ancient religion by the Roman government because it was an ancient religion. It went back in the annals of antiquity. Therefore, the Jews were given general freedom to worship the way they did. And early on, the movement, the Jesus movement, was considered a subsect of Judaism, and therefore it was tolerated. But by the time we get to 60 AD, there are various historical events that are taking place that there's beginning to be a separation between the Jesus people being a subset of Judaism and being something all its own and something new. And that's what got Christianity into trouble with the Roman government because it was perceived, this is a new religion. We have no tolerance for anything new. And in fact, on one occasion, 13 years before the writing of Ephesus, there's so much disturbance in the city of Rome that there was rioting around the various synagogues of Rome over a man named Christus, which was a mispronunciation of Crestus. Christus is a slave name. And they misunderstood what it was over, and so they kicked all the Jews out of Rome over this rioting that they couldn't control. What was the rioting? The Jewish people those who were rejecting Jesus as their Messiah against the Jewish people who were believing Jesus as their Messiah. And that began in 49 AD and continued to build until we're into the 60s AD when now the Jesus movement is suddenly, or not suddenly, but gradually perceived, this is not ancient Judaism. This is maybe something different as far as Rome saw things. What's the purpose of Paul writing to the Ephesians? In that process, the early believers at Ephesus had plenty of Jews in the congregations. Paul's been gone for almost seven years. Um, and in those seven years, there's not very many Jews that are coming to know Jesus. It's historically been the pattern for my people. You know, if you've got uh, a thousand Jews and two come to Jesus, you have a spiritual revival. Okay. But what happens in those times? more and more Gentiles are coming to know Jesus. And you know what's happening to the expression of what they're doing and how they're doing it when they come together? It's more Gentile-ish and less Jewish. Um, the way we worship is a Gentile way to worship. Believe. Somebody asked me, do you like the way we worship? I love the way we worship. Do you do it the way you would like to have it? Oh, of course not. It'd be a lot more Jewish. And you would be uncomfortable. 
But being the only Jew, I just didn't think it was right for me to force my Jewishness on all of you. That's what's happened to you 2,000 years ago. As more and more Gentiles are coming into these local Jesus assemblies, and so there's a tension building between the Jewish believers and between the Gentile believers, and the Jewish believers are feeling more and more uncomfortable because there's nothing that they're familiar with, and in likelihood there was a separation between the fellowships. And now suddenly, instead of Jews and Gentiles together worshiping, you got the Gentiles in all their house churches, and the Jews, most likely, were forming their little tiny congregations in their house churches because they weren't at home anymore among all the Gentile believers. And so there's this separation and division going on. Paul writes to Ephesians, and what does he write? As a primary purpose to remind the Gentile believers of the value and the heritage of the Jewishness of everything they believe in in Messiah Jesus and then not to abandon it. He's trying to encourage that these house church fellowships stay united in understanding. Yes, you can't all meet in the same place, but stay united in your inner church, inner congregational fellowship, whether you're Jew or Gentile. And for all of you Gentiles, he's simply saying, don't forget that Jesus is Jewish and the roots of everything you do and are is Jewish. At the same time, there's a secondary purpose he's writing this letter. He's trying to equip these Gentile believers who've come out of demonic practices and we're talking about what is real. Demonic power, demonic presence. And he's writing to say, I am trying to equip you against what you've come that you can stand up and be strong in your walk with Jesus. Artemis isn't the Savior. Jesus is the Savior. And to teach and to train and to equip them that you don't need to be intimidated by the demonic realm whatsoever from where it's you came. And we'll get into that even within the first chapter when he piles word upon word upon word about the power that we have in Jesus Christ. Well, now you're ready for the study of Ephesus and Ephesians. Let's stand in closing. Can you tell I'm a little excited today? (laughs) The Bible's not boring, and the Bible is relevant, and the truth of God is exciting, and I can't wait to journey with you this year into truth. I don't want to add more knowledge up here. I want to add more knowledge to my experience in walking with Jesus, and I hope that's your prayer too. Father in heaven, as we conclude today, I thank you for the Apostle Paul. Oh, my. Thank you for the fact that you moved upon his heart on a particular moment in time when he took up his stylus and he began to write the words that we're about to read and study 2,000 years later. And they're not just words on a page, Lord. They are the living, dynamic breath of you. And so as we engage your truths in this book, Lord, grip our minds and hearts each and every week and transform us and grow us and change us and alter us to be more as you desire us to look like your son, Jesus, whose glorious name we pray. And God's people better say, amen, amen. You're dismissed.